This is uh, Unit 7 of Plants and Society, New Crops to Feed the World. The world population has grown, as you can see from this graph right here, from the 1800s all the way up to some estimates what it might be in 2100. We all know of world starvation. How are we going to feed all these people? Well, we can do it through the advent of new crops. Here's a map uh, that shows our world population density. Most of us are aware of this. Um, India having the huge amount of people, followed by China. And again, we all hear of starvation. How are we going to do? In 2004, 60 million people worldwide died from malnutrition and starvation. It even happens in the United States of America. There are not too many places where you can go around and see this picture. We have fresh vegetables, cucumbers, tomatoes, carrots, potatoes, zucchini, there's some mushrooms there, leeks, peppers. We don't see this very much throughout the world. Even in the United States, we don't see this as much. We're starting to do more and more of this now. We're realizing that fresh food can eliminate starvation and help our health. When we look at corn, what we eat today, we look at it and it's got these nice kernels. It's big, it's got white and yellow kernels. The white means that there's a lot more sugar content there, tastes sweeter. But we don't realize that in just a couple hundred years, it's come from this small teal centi, which actually looked like a grass. Look at how small that is on the other side. Those are hard kernels. We have learned through manipulation, through natural selection, through artificial selection, to get the corn that we have today. We can do this with other plants also. We can take tomatoes, we can take carrots, we can take uh, corn and grow them inside. Uh, we don't have to have everything outside in the perfect natural sunlight environment and rain. We can grow them inside with artificial conditions and still think about feeding the world. When you look at all these different vegetables, what you don't realize is that many of them came from the same plant. In this example right here, there's six different vegetables that actually came from the same wild mustard. We have kale in the upper left corner. What happened from that wild mustard? Through some change of the genes, this is, again, through natural selection, the leaves grew larger. We have kale. Uh, just below that, we have cauliflower. Where in this case here, they developed flowers, but they were sterile. So we have these big cauliflower heads. Uh, down below that, broccoli. Again, the flowers were different. They very slowly matured, which allowed us to have the green broccoli that we see nowadays. On the other side, we have cabbage. Got these big heads of cabbage. Again, this all came from wild mustard, and through the years of artificial and natural selection, we got them where today. The one below the cabbage is Brussels sprouts. That in the nodes, we have these little like cabbage heads. Uh, and then the very bottom, that's kohlrabi. That again, the the meristems that we saw about in unit two were large and lateral, so we got these new plants. So it can happen, we can develop even now new plants to feed us. I started thinking about this in a very scientific manner with a gentleman called Norman Borlaug. He was the person who gave the idea of the Green Revolution. Uh, the Green Revolution would allow us to look at the rest of the world and feed them. We weren't as worried about the United States at that time. We were worried again about South America, Africa. So we started developing uh, research stations, especially in South America. We wanted to get 
wheat and rice produced throughout the world. We wanted to get the best yields that were out there. We wanted to get the best plants that had the, the least amount of disease in them. We know that we could take wheat, for example, and as we hybridized it, as we used uh, natural and artificial selection, the plants were not as strong internally. They were smaller so they could withstand the wind and the rain. And if they got snow on them, they didn't collapse and fall to the ground and get fungus on them. The stems did become stronger. However, they were more susceptible to diseases. What happened? Uh, Number one, it was expensive. Uh, it was hard to get fertilizer out to the rest of the world. Um, many other parts of the world relied upon natural fertilizers. Uh, they didn't have large plants to produce this. So it became very costly to do this. It also became costly from the environmental point of view because as we added more and more chemicals, we'd have more and more runoff, which would then go into the streams and poison the fish, poison some plants even. And of course, this led back to um, poisoning of mankind too. We also lost the problem of uh, different types of plants, different types of wheat. Uh, we all learned from the chapter on starches, when we looked at the potato, if we had one kind of potato and that potato was infected, we could have large amounts of starvation. We saw this in Ireland. One of the other problems too was that uh, the water supply. Here's in the, the mid part of the United States, uh, the Ogallala Aquifer. This is a huge body of water, which is way beneath the ground, extending from South Dakota all the way to Texas. When you fly across the United States, you see all these uh, circles, green circles. And what is happening is that the farmers are pumping up water from this aquifer to feed their corn, to water their soybeans. The trouble is, is that it takes hundreds of years, if not thousands of years, for water to filter down from the top of the ground down back to this aquifer or to any aquifer. It's shrinking. And not only is it shrinking, it may have some salt formed in it, which now makes it unable to be used. Uh, remember, this has been formed for thousands of years, and we are depleting it too quickly. I mentioned before to you that uh, as we get more and more uh, food, we get more and more people. And then if something happens to it, the people then can starve. Um, another problem is, is that we start to irrigate the ground itself uh, filters out uh, some of the chemicals that are in there. Uh, what we're seeing in Southern California now is that there is a layer of clay three, four feet under the ground. So that as we irrigate this, the chemicals that were in this water are became trapped above this clay layer. And as it becomes trapped, uh, the water um, filters out but it leaves these harsh chemicals behind and it may well be then in a hundred years or less that all the land in Southern California will not be able to be harvested. Again, we have to be careful. Uh, if we plant too many of the same plant, if they get a disease, then all those plants in the area get a disease. Uh, on the left, this is a huge uh, coffee plantation. This is in Sri Lanka, uh, which is that island just uh, uh, south of India. It used to be called Ceylon. Uh, they had a fungus come in. It was a fungus, which was a type of rust, which turned everything to a rusty color. This came in there, destroyed all the coffee trees. We lost Sri Lankan coffee for multiple years. It can happen in developing countries in South Florida. We had trees that were infected by a bacteria. Um, in South Florida, uh, we had a, a type of 
orange tree, which was actually brought there by the Spaniards, and it was all the same type of trees. Uh, there wasn't much genetic diversity. It wasn't only until recently that uh, that the navel orange was uh, cloned, and then this was brought to California and other places. But now we only had one type of tree in uh, Florida, which when the bacteria came in, wiped out all the trees. So we have to be careful. Uh, one of the other things that you are discussing in this whole sustainable agriculture uh, units is how can we get profitability? How do we get profitable uh, farming communities? How do we take charge of the environment so that we don't destroy it? One of the things that we do do is we save seeds. We have things called the gene banks. Um, we try to have them in places where uh, they cannot be disturbed, and we like to keep them up in the north uh, in isolated areas. Many seeds can be frozen. Um, however, what we found is that we have to be careful because some seeds need to be planted every year. We can save the DNA of some of these plants. Um, again, this is important to do. Um, not only do we have the coffee troubles or the, the bacteria in the citrus trees or the fungus, the potatoes, we lost over 20,000 varieties of rice in India uh, because of this. We do have these seed banks. Uh, these seed banks are in various countries. Uh, again, they, they can be trouble because, number one, not only all we cannot store all the world's seeds. We have a problem that who do these seeds belong to? Uh, some seeds need to be propagated every year or every two years in order to stay viable. Um, we're losing all of our wild species. Uh, the potato, for example, has over 100 different wild species out there which we have not saved. Poor countries, less developed countries, uh, may not be able to afford having a SD bank. Um, we may find that uh, certain countries say that certain plants belong to them. Ethiopia is saying now that uh, all the coffee trees belong to them. So we have to be careful uh, when we have these seed banks.